Hello everyone, it's Kasa here. Today we're going to take a look at PPO implementation details to deal with continuous action spaces. A quick recap is our first video had covered 11 general implementation details and our second video has covered 9 Atari specific implementation details. In today's video, we'll take a look at 8 implementation details to help deal with games with continuous action spaces such as PyBullet and Mujuko. By the end of this video, you'll learn how to train an agent to play the Half Cheetah environment in PyBullet. Without further ado, let's get started. Our first step is to go to our repository and create a copy of ppo.py and rename it to ppocontinuousaction.py. Then we're going to use our IDE spider to open the newly created file. And at the top of the file, import pybulletenv. And we're going to modify the gym ID to Hapcheta bullet env v0. Like last time, I'm going to set a race and run the script so that we can play around with the ends. Here we check out n single action space where we see six negative ones and six positive ones, which are lower and upper bounds for the six action components in a continuous action space. We can also check out the single observation space where we can see 26 unbounded low level features. Then, our first implementation detail is to generate continuous actions via normal distributions. If you recall, our previous PPO scripts are able to deal with discrete actions, which are integers that look like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. However, in continuous action space, we're dealing with real numbers, which looks like this. The standard way of generating continuous actions with policy gradient methods is to use normal distributions to describe the policy. Here is how it works. For each of our action component, we generate a mean and a standard deviation. These means and standard deviations are then used to construct normal distributions from which the action components are sampled. And then we can get the action at the current time step by concatenating these action components. To translate this in code, let us import the normal distribution from PyTorch. Scrolling down, and we're going to modify the actors network. Instead of generating logits for the categorical distribution, we're going to generate means for the normal distribution. Since we're dealing with the continuous action space, we also need to modify the output features of the last linear layer to the product of the single action space shape. Then, our second implementation detail is to generate the center deviation a little bit unintuitively. Here's the code. First, we don't generate the center deviation directly, but rather we generate the log center deviation. And secondly, the log center deviations are just learnable neural network parameters that don't take any inputs. This means the log center deviations are state independent. During the forward pass, we first get the means, then get the log center deviation to match the output size of the means. Here we would show an example. As we can see, the log center deviations are initially set to be zeros, and it'll match the first dimension of the actor's mean, which is the same as the num ends, which is 4 in this case. Then we could get the center deviation by doing the exponent of the log center deviation. Combining it with the mean, we get the normal distribution. Then we could remove the code to handle the categorical distribution, knowing the sample log probability and entropy functions will still work. Our third implementation detail is to assume the action AT is composed of multiple independent action components. In code, this translates to summing up the log probabilities of the action components. Because of the logarithm addition rule, we're essentially saying the summation of the log probability of taking the action components is the same as log product of the probability of taking the action components which is the same as the log probability of taking the action at the current time step. More intuitively, we're really saying the action AT is composed of statistically independent action components. Similarly, we'll also sum up the entropies for the action components. On a related note, this idea could also apply to Jim's multi-discrete action space, which uses multiple discrete numbers to describe an action in a time step. And the code would roughly look like this, where you would also sum up the log probabilities and entropies for the discrete action components. 
Sometimes a multi-discrete action space can be pretty bloated and has a lot of invalid actions and it turns out it's really important to mask out the invalid actions during training. Feel free to check out our paper to read more. Well, that was kind of a digression. Going back, one very important thing to do is to scroll down and remove the code that converts the midi batch actions to integers since we are no longer in the discrete action space. At this point, if we move up, remove the raise, and modify the assert statement correspondingly, our code would run. To get a more serious run, let us use the hyperparameters for the Mojuko environments in the original implementation. We will first modify the learning rate to 3e-4, change the total time steps to 2 million, modify the numms to 1, num steps to 2048, change the num mini batches to 32, update epochs 10, and entropy coefficient 0. I think this is an interesting point to just give the script a run because our code is runnable. While we wait for this experiment to finish, we'll go back to other implementation details. It's very important to understand that the original implementation does a lot of pre-processing to the environment. Specifically, we would create the make and function as follows. The first part of the function records the episode statistics and videos, and the second part pre-processes the environment. And we have come to our fourth implementation detail, which is to clip the action to its valid range before sending it to the environment. Here, we check out the source code of the clip action wrapper, and we see it basically clips the action to the lower and upper bounds of the action space. Note that if the agent generates an out-of-bound action, we still save that action in the storage for the forward pass consistency during training. However, the environment would execute the clipped action. Our fifth implementation detail is the observation normalization. Let us check out the source code. And the way it works is we would create a utility class to keep track of the running means and center deviations of things. And here we create an RMS variable to keep track of the running means and center deviations of the observations. Every time the environment returns an observation, we call the normalize function, which updates the running means and center deviations of the RMS, and then normalize the observation by subtracting the RMS's means and divided by the RMS's center deviation. Using terms from mathematical statistics, this process is also known as standardization. And the standardized observation will generally have zero mean and unit variance. Our sixth implementation detail is observation clipping. Going back to the makeN function, we will use a transform observation wrapper and a lambda function to clip the normalized observation within the range of negative 10, 10. Our seventh implementation detail is reward normalization. Here, we check out the source code again. And it's kind of weird. Instead of creating an RMS for the rewards, we create an RMS for the returns. And these returns are discounted returns, which is why we have the gamma in the classes argument. Every time the environment returns a reward, we calculate the discounted return and then call the normalize function on the reward. In this function, we first update the RMS for the returns, then we normalize rewards by divided by the return standard deviation. Unlike the observation normalization, we're not subtracting the mean, and when we divide by the standard deviation, it's the return standard deviation, not the reward standard deviation. Our eighth implementation detail is reward clipping. Going back to the makeN function, we're going to use a transform reward wrapper along with the lambda function to clip the normalized reward to the range of negative 10, 10. This is all the implementation details to deal with the continuous action space, and let's open up the terminal and give it a run. And here are the results. Over here, the pink experiment is the one that we have added all of the normalization wrappers. As we can see in episodic return curve, having normalization really helps the agent's performance in the beginning, however, they converge to the same episodic return later. Another thing to note is having the normalization wrapper significantly reduces the scale of the value loss, and that is because of the rewards normalization. 
That said, I was surprised to see the episode return to be the same in the end. And I was thinking maybe it was because I was using my macOS to run the experiments. So I ended up using my Linux machine to do the same experiments again. We can go to the experiments page and check out the overview section and see the operating system that was used to run the experiment. And over here, I have the yellow line, which is the script that has all of the normalization wrappers. And if we go to the episodic returns chart, we see having normalization makes a much huger difference in the beginning of the training. However, they do sort of converge to the same results in the end. One last note is that to help us understand the agent's performance, we can always check out the videos of the agents playing the game, which always offer insights on how the agent exactly achieved the episodic return. If you want to read more about the effect of the normalization wrappers to continuous action spaces, consider checking out the paper from Inkstorm and Ilias et al., where they have done some very interesting ablation studies. I'd also recommend the paper from Andrew Coes et al., where they have done ablation studies on 68 design decisions with a continuous action space. Here is a quick summary of changes. We first import the pi bullet ends, the normal distribution, then we change the gym ID, learning rate, total time steps, num amps, num steps, num mini batches, update epochs, entropy coefficient, then we add the normalization wrappers. Then we modify the neural network to output the actor's mean, change the last linear layer to output six action components, generate the state independent log standard deviation, create a normal distribution to sample actions, and then sum up the log probabilities and entropies. Then we modify the assertion statement to work with the continuous action space, and lastly, remove the code that converts the mini batch actions to discrete actions. And everything else is the same. Before we wrap up, I have a homework for interested viewers. So far, we have covered implementation details to handle the pixel observation space and continuous action space. Given this, can you modify our PPO implementation to make it work with car racing v0 environment, which has pixel observations and continuous action space? Feel free to give this a try, and my answer is linked in the video description. This concludes our last video in the PPO tutorial series. Thanks so much for following along. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment down below.